If you will turn in your Bibles to the 12th chapter, the book of Nehemiah, as we continue our study through the word. And so you'll remember that they had been reading out of the book of the law and they were suddenly convicted that they had not been in keeping the law. And, and so you remember that there was this revival that takes place. They, you remember how they went and celebrated the completion of the building of the walls, but then there was the conviction that they had not been keeping the law. And you'll remember also that the Feast of Tabernacles was coming shortly. And so everybody got very excited to be able to go and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. And a covenant was made. And, and they said, yes, we are going to keep the law. We are going to be God's people. And, and there was a great celebration that took place now. How wonderful it is when we are right with God. Amen? When, when we are just clean and right before him and how exciting that is in our lives. Oftentimes, we can have difficulty even knowing how refreshing it is to be right with God when there is compromise in our life that just slowly kind of drifts us away from God. The compromise can just be not pursuing God with our whole heart and soul and mind and strength, not even that there is this catastrophic sin that is in our life, just the drift that takes place to where God isn't first place in our life. And then suddenly there is a, a conviction, an awakening, a, a prodding, a poke, a, a, a goad that the Lord just sticks in. in and, and we like, you know, pop back up and, and we wake up to the reality of what we're doing wrong. I remember when I was growing up, my mom, <laughs> whenever we were sitting at the kitchen table, and if you weren't using your manners properly, you know, you would suddenly, my mom would just underneath the table take her fork and just poke you, you know, and you'd be like, oh, you know, and you'd get this little poke and you'd be like, oh, my elbows are on the table. Or, you know, she wouldn't say anything, just, just a poke. And all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're back. And sometimes, you know, the Lord just kind of pokes us and we're like, what? Oh, oh, you know, and, and there's this, and then there's the afterwards of how good it feels now to be right with the Lord again and to have him reestablished into that first place. And, and so the nation now, they had a, a, a poke, and, and, and again, remembering where they are in their history. They've just come out of captivity for 70 years because of their disobedience to the Lord. And now they're back in their land, and they're trying to get it right. They're trying to do the right things before the Lord. And, uh, and so here, you know, Zerubbabel and then Ezra and now Nehemiah, all of them helping to reestablish their nation once again. And so we see that now there, there, there was this reaffirmation of the covenant of God. We are God's people by covenant. And so now that covenant was significant as it was being read. It formed their identity. And their identity had kind of been set aside as they lost their way, but now they were gravitating back and towards it again. We are God's people by covenant, amen? We're God's people underneath the new covenant, the covenant of, uh, of grace. And now we have the indwelling spirit of God inside of us. And now we're, we're defined by this new covenant. Our identity isn't in what we, what we wear or what we do for a living, what our job title is, how many letters come after, uh, after our name. Our identity now is in Christ. We're in Christ, we're a child of God, and we are redeemed. We're princes and princesses in the kingdom of God. That's your identity. And God now has called you to live as a, a child of God, to live as a princess, to live as a prince, to represent the kingdom principles. And, and so our identity is in Christ, it's in Christ. Our value is in Christ. We're valuable because we're made in the image and likeness of God, and we are God's. And so regardless of how you might feel about yourself, regardless of how many mistakes you've made in your life or what your life looks like, it doesn't matter. That's the externals. That's the way the world judges you. In God's eyes, you're his, and he loves you. And you've been made in his image and likeness, and you are infinitely valuable. And if you were the only person on the face of the earth, Christ would have died just for you. Christ would have died just for you. That's how much he loves you. 
And so our identity comes from who we are, and who we are is we are a child of God in Christ. They had kind of lost their identity. They had drifted away. They were compromising with the nations that were around them, trying to be the best of them that they could be. But rather than understanding that the best them that they could be would, would be to follow the covenant that God had created with them, they started to look at the other nations and start to pull in this aspect and this aspect and this aspect and kind of merge it in. And what did they end up with? They ended up with this smorgasbord now that they completely lost their identity. And so God gave them a time out, pulls them out of the land, resets them, sends them back into the land. And, and now they're just kind of getting their feet underneath them. And, uh, and so here we see last time how they were so excited to be able to, to establish the covenant. Remember that Nehemiah then says, okay, we've, we've re-centered Jerusalem as our capital city. We've got the walls built around it, but there's not enough people living in the city to sustain the city. And so you remember that then that they drafted the people by lottery to come in and to move into the city so that they would have enough people to be able to open the gates and close the gates and to run everything. And so now the people are, are back. In. And we saw this list of the names last time of, uh, of the people that were now, in, the, in Jerusalem and those that were living outside of Jerusalem. And as we begin now in this 12th chapter, we're going to see that we're going to have an, another wonderful list of names uh, before us. And uh, that's always so exciting. Um, and so these are the names now of the, uh, of the priests and the Levites. And, and so while they're just, they may be difficult names to pronounce and read, each one of them is a story in and of themselves, is a life that God created and established. And these were the Levites now that had that privilege of coming and serving God and were called to be able to take a step closer to God than other people. Now, remember, that was by birth because you had to be a Levite in order to be able to serve at the temple. And that's just serving at the temple. The, all the Levites, they were allowed to serve the temple. It means you could chop the wood and clean the coals. Now, out of the Levites came the priests. You had to be of the sons of Aaron, uh, of the tribe of Levi. That was the priestly line. So the Levites in and of themselves, they were responsible for being able to take care of the temple, but the, the out of the Levites, it was the priests themselves now that could offer the sacrifices. And so to us today, we no longer have a, a priestly system whereby we have to uh, stand back and allow others to come close to God. All of that has been done away with in the new covenant, and we now get to approach God personally on an individual basis with him. But back then, these were the priests. These were the ones that were given that special blessing, that special calling by God to be able to come nearer. And so we have a list now of the names of the priests and the Levites that came up. First of all, it's going to begin with the, those that had come with Zerubbabel, verse 1 of chapter 12. And it says, and, and these are the priests and the Levites who came up with Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua, and Syriah and Jeremiah, Ezra, Amariah, Malak, Hattush, and Shechariah, Rehem, Merimoth, Ido, Ginnathal, and Abijah, and Mijamim, and Maadiah, and Bilga, and Shemaiah, and Joyarib, and Jediah, and Salu, and Amok, and Hilkiah, and Jedidiah, and these were the heads, it says, of the priests and their brethren in the days of Jeshua. And so moreover now, the Levites were Jeshua, Benui, Kedmiel, Sherebiah, Judah, and Madaniah, who led the thanksgiving songs, and he and his brethren. And also 
Bakbukiah and Unai, their brethren, stood across from them in their duties. And Jeshua begot Joachim, and Joachim begot Eliashib, and Eliashib begot Joida, and Joida begot Jonathan, and Jonathan begot Jadua. And now in the days of Joachim, the priests, the heads of the father's houses were Sarariah, Merariah of Jeremiah, Hananiah of Ezra, Meshullam of Amariah, Jehohanan of Melchachu, Jonathan of Shabaniah, Joseph of Harim, Adna of Merariah, and Helkai of Ido, Zechariah of Ginnathon, Meshullam. And of Abijah, Zikri, the son of Mijamin, of Moadiah, Pilte of Bilga, Shamua of Shemaha, Jehonathan of Joarib, Matanai of Jedai, Yuza of Salai, Kalai, Amok, Eber of Hilakai, Hashabiah and of Jedi, of Jedi Nathanel. During the reign of Darius the Persian, a record was also kept of the Levites and priests who had been heads of their father's houses in the days of Eliashib, Joida, Johanan, and Jedua. And the sons of Levi, the heads of the father's houses until the days of Johanan, the son of Eliashib, were written in the book of the Chronicles. And the heads of the Levites were Hashabiah, Sherebiah, and Jeshua, the son of Cadmiel, with their brothers across from them to praise and give thanks, group alternating with group according to the command of David, the man of God. And so you remember that the priests were split up into 24 courses, and, and then each of those courses would serve at the temple two weeks out of the year. And, and so here are the divisions that are being given underneath the, uh, the high priests. And, and so verse 25 Mataniah, Bakbukiah, Obadiah, Meshelam, Talmon, and Akab were gatekeepers, keeping the watch at the storerooms of the gates. And these lived in the days of Joachim, the son of Jeshua, the son of Josadak, uh, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor, and of Ezra the priest, the scribe. Now, at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving and singing, with cymbals and stringed instruments and harps. And, and so now they're, they are going to have this celebration of dedicating the wall. They've completed, <laughs> they've completed the task of building the wall. And now they just want to have this dedication of the wall to the Lord. And so this joyous time of gathering together. With thanksgiving, it says, and with singing and with cymbals and, and stringed instruments. And it says that uh, in verse 28, And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Natophathites, from the house of Gilgal, from the fields of Geba and Asmaveth, for the singers had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. And so here the, those that were serving were staying outside of Jerusalem, but they were staying close by. And so they had built these villages around Jerusalem. It says in verse 30, then the priests and Levites purified themselves and purified the people, the gates, and the wall. And so this consecration as they are now seeking to draw near to God and to be able to celebrate the, the great work that God had done in building the wall and regathering them together again in their nation, restoring them, placing them back in, giving them victory over their enemies. There was so much to be thankful for. And so they're consecrating themselves to be able to approach God in order to say thank you. Now, once again, what separates us from God's sin is what separates us from God. And so if we want to approach God, they would take and, and have their 
ceremonial baths, the mikvahs, uh, where they would go into the bath and cleanse themselves, ritual cleansings, and, and they would now purify themselves before God just to be able to come and say thank you to God. So if you're going to go visit somebody important, you get cleaned up and put on your best clothes, and then you go to enter into their presence. And so kind of the same thought is if you're going to come into the presence of God, then you want to get yourself washed up and cleaned up and get yourself ready to, to come into his presence. And so there was this great time of, of purification and getting themselves uh, ready. So they purified the people, they purified the gates, and they purified the wall. And it says in verse 31, And so I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall and appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. And one went to the right hand on the wall toward the refuse gate, and after them went to Hoshiah and half of the leaders of Judah, and Azariah, Ezra, Meshullam, Judah, Benjamin, Shemaiah, and Jeremiah, and some of the priests' sons with trumpets, Zechariah, the son of Jonathan, the son of Shemaiah, the son of Mataniah, the son of Micaiah, the son of Zachar, the son of Asaph, and his brethren, Shemaiah and Azarel, and Milali and Gil Gilali and Mai, Nathaniel, Judah, and Hanani, with the musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra the scribe went before him. So these two great choirs are formed, and one heads to one side, and the other goes on the other side. And and it says in verse 37 now, by the fountain gate, in the front of them, they went up the stairs of the city of David. And on the stairway of the wall, beyond the house of David, as far as the water gate eastward. And the other thanksgiving choir went the opposite way. And I was behind them with half of the people on the wall, going past the tower of the ovens as far as the broad wall, and above the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate, above the fish gate, the tower of Hananel's, the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate, and as they stopped by the gate of the prison. Now, remember that for Nehemiah and for the people, there hadn't been any walls. And so not only did they build the walls, but then remember they built all of these gates. And so what are they doing? They're going around to all of the gates now that, that they have built that now protect the, the city. In verse 40, it says that, so the two thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God, Likewise, I and half of the rulers with me, and the priests, uh, Eliakim, and Maaseiah, and Minjamin, and Micamiah, and Elione, and Zechariah, and Hananiah with trumpets, and also Maaseiah, and Shemaiah, and Eliezer, and Uzzah, and Jehoiahan, and Malkijah, and Elam, and Ezer. The singer is saying loudly with Jezrahiah, the director. And, and so you had this Jezrahiah who was the, uh, the worship leader. Now, in Jezrahiah, that's Hebrew. And, and if you look at this, Jezra in Hebrew means Joe, and, and Haya means Monto. So I think this says, and then the director here was Joe Monto, was the, leading the choirs in, in the people. I'm not exactly sure on my Hebrew on that, but I think, I think that that's pretty accurate. Verse 43. Also, that day they offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with what joy? With great joy. Just seeing if you're following along here, if you're just looking at your watch right now. So it says, The women and the children also rejoiced, so that the joy of Jerusalem was heard where? Afar off. So this was just a joyous celebration that is taking place. And the choirs are singing, and the people are praising God, and they've gotten back to their covenant. 
They've gotten back to the Lord. And the Bible says that the joy of the Lord will be our strength, will be our strength. There is just a goodness and a richness and a strength when we are girded and tightly into the word of God and, and when we are fel <coughs> fellowshipping and in intimacy with God. And so their joy is just over the top. It says here that, that the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. May that be the testimony for us. When we come and worship the Lord, may, may the joy of our worship be heard and be felt when people enter into the congregation and they experience the worship that we have here in, in our church. And, and may there just be this, this incredible joy that is heard. And in verse 44, and at the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for the offerings, the first fruits, and the tithes to gather into them from the fields of the cities the portions specified by the law for the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced uh, over the priests and Levites who ministered. And so here again, those that were called by God to lead the people into God's presence. Judah rejoiced over the priests uh, and the Levites uh, who ministered. Verse 45, both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon, his son. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. It was a time when worship was uh, heard nonstop there and, and how David's great desire was to build that temple to God and to see God's people come and worship on an ongoing basis. You'll remember that he created the design for the services and for the rotation of the people. Now Solomon instituted it, but David is the one that had laid that out. And, and so here it says in verse 47, in the days of Zerubbabel and then in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, a portion for each day. And they also consecrated holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. So the children of Aaron are the priests, and so the priests are a part of the Levites. And so what is it saying here is, is that the people were now faithfully bringing their tithe in, and the tithe is what was supporting the Levites, and the Levites were the ones who were looking after the spiritual condition of the people. And so everything was functioning just the way that it was supposed to, and it was just this glorious dedication, this glorious consecration now of, uh, the, uh, of the walls and of the people to God. And so now we move to chapter 13. And we see here in chapter 13 that they're celebrating and, uh, and all. And it says, and on that day, they read from the book of Moses and the hearing of the people. And in it was found written that no Ammonite or Moabite should ever come into the assembly of God because they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water, but hired Balaam against them to curse them. However, our God turned the curse into a blessing. And so here again, they're reading out of the book of the law. And in Deuteronomy chapter 23, beginning in verse 3, this is what it says. It says that an Ammonite or Moabite shall not enter the assembly of the Lord, even to the 10th generation, none of his descendants shall enter the assembly of the Lord forever, because they did not meet you with bread and water on the road when you came out of Egypt, and because they hired against you Balaam, the son of Beor from Pethor of Mesopotamia, to curse you. Nevertheless, the Lord your God would not listen to Balaam, but the Lord your God turned the curse into a blessing for you because the Lord your God loves you. And you shall not seek their peace nor their prosperity all your days forever. You shall not abhor an Edomite, for he is your brother. You shall not abhor an Egyptian, 
because you were an alien in his land. The children of the third generation to them may enter the assembly of the Lord. So we see here that there's three groups of people that in Deuteronomy, that specific direction is given. Now, the Ammonites and the Moabites, we see that they were never to enter into the congregation of the nation of Israel. Now, the Ammonites and the Moabites, they come from the offspring of Lot. And you remember how Lot had his two daughters. And, and remember after Lot's wife, was she perished, how the two daughters then had an incestuous relationship with the Moab. The Ammonites and the Moabites, they come out of those two relationships there. And so here we see that that, that, that isn't the reason, though, that they're excluded from ever entering in. That's just the identity of who they are, so we recognize that. But the reason happens when God is bringing the nation out uh, of Egypt, and as they have now wandered for 40 years, and they're passing through to be able to cross over the Jordan and enter into their land. And as they pass through, we see that they do not come out and help them in their journey. We see that the uh, that they did not that they had not met the children of Israel with bread and water. We see the Moabites did give them bread and water, but sold it to them. Deuteronomy tells us that that was the Ammonites who would not help them uh, at, at all. And so we see the hiring of Balaam. Uh, this uh, now was the Mo Moabites did this in conjunction with the Midianites and, uh, and the Ammonites did not have a part of that. So they're reading the law and this is now what God commanded through Moses and in verse three. And so it was when they heard the law that they separated all the mixed multitude from Israel. Now, this was done in compliance to their pledge. Remember, they had pledged that they were going to keep the law and that they were to uh, remove uh, any of the mixed multitude from the nation. God had strictly forbidden the marriage of the Hebrews with any of the Hegans, with, with heathens, with any of the pagans. And so now we see that there is this, this purging of their sin and back to their obedience. And, and now we're going to see that the book of Nehemiah kind of closes with a, a summary of Nehemiah's reforms once he had arrived back in Jerusalem after a trip to report to Artaxerxes. Now, you remember how it was that uh, that there was the report that had come to Nehemiah. You remember that Nehemiah was the cupbearer of Artaxerxes, and he's there in, in the court, and he gets the report of how there are no walls in Jerusalem. It's all broken down. And, and you remember that, uh, that he's deeply you know, concerned, overwhelmed, and, and that he didn't have his joy in the presence of the king, and the king had asked him, you know, what's wrong? And he said, how can I have my joy when my people are, are perishing? And he says, what would you... What would you have me to do? He says, let me go there and, and let me rebuild it. And, and he says, how long do you need? And remember that there was a fixed set time that Nehemiah was going to go there and to restore this. Well, Nehemiah's time has, uh, has elapsed and he goes back now and he is there in Persia. And now Artaxerxes lets him return again back to Jerusalem to check on things and, and how everything is coming. And so <clears throat> as we have the last section of this chapter, these are the things that, that Nehemiah finds after he has gone back to Persia and seen Artaxerxes, and now he comes back again to see how everything is running. And so uh, it says in verse 4, it says, now before this, Eliashib the priest, having authority over the storerooms of the house of our God, was allied with Tobiah. Now, Eliashib is the high priest. And so we have the high priest 
who has formed an alliance with Tobiah. Remember that Tobiah was one of the chief enemies of Nehemiah in getting the walls rebuilt. He was the one that was trying with, along with Sanballat and, and the others that were writing the open letter, trying to draw him out, trying to kill him, trying to stop him from, uh, from the work of rebuilding of the walls. So now that when, when Nehemiah heads back uh, to Persia, and now upon his return, he discovers that the high priest has formed an alliance with Tobiah. And so he is just grieved and distressed uh, over this. And, uh, and it says now that uh, in verse 5, and he had prepared for him a large room where previously they had stored the grain offerings, the frankincense, the articles, the tithes of grain, the new wine and oil, which were commanded to be given to the Levites and singers and gatekeepers and the offerings for the priests. Now, we see here that, uh, that, that Eliashib, who is the high priest, has ended up allowing Tobiah to be using one of the large rooms that was underneath the temple, one of the storehouse rooms. This is the place where they had kept the tithe, where they had kept the sacrifices and, and, and all. So they had cleaned that out, and suddenly now when Nehemiah comes back, he discovers that, that the high priest is giving access to Tobiah. Now, Tobiah, is, he's not a Jew. And so he's not even supposed to be in the temple or anywhere near around the temple. And so it says in, in verse 6, he says, But during all this I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. And then after certain days I obtained leave from the king. And I came to Jerusalem and discovered the evil that Eliashib had done for Tobiah in preparing a room for him in the courts of the house of God. And so we see here that those rooms, these were the places where the meat offering and the frankincense and the sacred vessels and all had been, uh, had been stored. And, and now that one of those rooms had been cleared out and Tobiah now had access to it. In verse 8, and it grieved me bitterly. And therefore I threw all the household goods of Tobiah uh, out of the room, that such a sacred place would now be converted to a common use, to a business enterprise. This was, was just a, a storage facility for Tobiah. We see that, uh, that him being now an enemy of the Jews, an enemy of their religion, and we see also that he was a heathen. When, when Nehemiah is trying to process all of this, of what the high priest uh, had done, the high priest who was supposed to be responsible now for the sanctity and for the sacredness of the temple and the things that were going on, he was the very one that had let the fox into the hen house. And, and all of this while Nehemiah had gone back to Persia to report back to Artaxerxes. And so when he comes back, he is just grieved on so many levels of this. First of all, Tobiah and all of the trouble that Tobiah, of all the people, Tobiah. And then of all the people to do it, the high priest. And so two great, great aspects of this. And so a great evil. And, and we see here that, that he throws all of the household goods of Tobiah out of the room. Nehemiah didn't wait and tell him to move the things out. He moved them out for him. You know, he took it and, and cleansed it out. And, and when I think about Nehemiah and how grieved he was when he comes and he sees now, you know, what's going on at the temple, the place that, you know, the restored worship was, uh, was taking place at. It reminds me of how Jesus comes to the temple, comes to his father's house, to the house of prayer, and what had they done to it? They had turned it into a bazaar. They had turned it into a, a marketplace. Uh, uh, those in business love to market the church because there is a great collection of people gathered together. And, uh, and for some, they see dollar signs anytime that there is a, a group of people that is gathered together. And, uh, and so here we see that 
that the Lord now, he, you remember how he cleanses the, the, the temple and how he overturns the, the money changers and carts and drives out those who were selling the sacrificial animals and all. And, and he declares, my house is a house of prayer. But you have made it a den of iniquity, a den of thieves now. And, and, and he cleanses them out. We see Nehemiah kind of in the same aspect comes back and here's the temple. They've just built the walls. They're, they've just recovenanted to establish the, their thing. And here is the compromise uh, right inside. And, and so he, he drives it out. And, and after he throws everything out, look at in verse 9. Then I commanded them to cleanse the rooms. And I brought back into them the articles of the house of God with the grain offering and the frankincense. So the cleaning wasn't just a sweeping out. It was a purification now. We see that he ends up putting the holy things back into the chamber, but not until after it had been purified. And so afterwards, now he's, he's got that situated, and then he discovers uh, that there's another problem that's been going on, verse 10. And I also realized that the portions for the Levites had not been given them. For each of the Levites and the singers who did the work had gone back to his field. Now, remember that the tithe would come in and out of the tithe, they were to supply the need of the Levites and of the priests. But what had happened is, is that they had stopped making those distributions. So those that had been serving at the temple, they weren't able to serve any longer and they had to go back to their fields and they had to continue now to make their living. And so when Nehemiah comes back, he's like, where, where's everybody serving and where's the singing and where's the worship of the Lord? And, and all because the distribution of the tithe wasn't taking place. And so, verse 11, I contended with the rulers and said, why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their place. He gathers the Levites and the singers that had departed and that were now back in the villages. And he, and he regathers them together. He turns to the rulers and he says, why did you let this happen? Why did you let this happen? Why did you let the house of God become forsaken? Now, remember, it wasn't run down. It just wasn't operating because they didn't have the Levites and the priests uh, there. And so, uh, and so it was forsaken from being the center of the life of the people. And how important it is to keep our worship as the center part of our life. How easy it is for the drift to just take place, the busyness of life and of our jobs, our schedules, and, and the incredible pace that we're living life, how easy it is for the worship of God to kind of slide to the side. And that's kind of what had happened for them. And everybody just kind of went back to their old ways again, kind of slipped back into their, into their old routines. And, and now when Nehemiah comes, he's he's surprised and he comes and rebukes the, the leaders and, and so he gathers back the, the Levites and the priests and, and gets the worship going again, verse 12. And then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain and the new wine and the oil to the storehouse. And, and so once they saw that the, the reformation had been made, we see that the people were bringing in their tithe and, and they were giving them to the proper persons who were now reinstated into their office. And in verse 13, we see that Nehemiah, the great administrator, so he says, you know, how can we prevent this from happening in the future? So he not only solves the problem, but then he institutes the changes that are necessary to be able to prevent things from repeating. And so he, here we see that it says in verse 13, and I appointed as treasurers over the storehouse Shelemiah the priest and Zadok the scribe and of the Levites and Pedadiah, and next to them was Hanan the son of Zachar, the son of Mataniah, for they were considered faithful 
and their task was to distribute to their brethren. And so we see that Nehemiah now puts treasurers over the treasuries. And so the collection of the tithe goes into the treasury, and now he puts these four faithful men. He, he chose the men because they were faithful to God. And, and we see that the high priest had been in charge of, of them earlier. But we see what the high priest was doing is, is that he was out for his own commercial gain, renting out or using some type of agreement with Tobiah, the storehouses, and the Levites weren't getting the distribution that they were supposed to. And, and so we see that Nehemiah now appoints these, uh, these faithful treasurers and uh, and so we see that he chose a priest, a Levite, a layman, and then also a scribe. And so they were not only to receive the tithe in, but they also were responsible for distributing it uh, as well. He says in verse 14, Remember me, O my God, concerning this, and do not wipe out my good deeds that I have done for the house of my God and for its services. When he sees that the worship has stopped, he's like, Lord, don't hold this against me that they messed up. <laughs> you know, I mean, I'm doing everything that I can to try and get the nation worshiping right. And so as they had gone off the track, we see Nehemiah, you know, recognizing that God isn't pleased with the lack of worship that was coming out of the nation and is asking God to remember the, the good things that, that he is working in. Verse 15. This is now also back after his visit to Artaxerxes. And it says, And in those days I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in sheaves and loading donkeys with wine, grapes, figs, and all kinds of burdens which they brought into Jerusalem on the Sabbath day. And I warned them about the day on which they were selling provisions. And so here we see that, that the people had said, yes, we're going to keep the law. Yes, we're God's covenanted people. And, uh, and you remember, you know, they had had the, the Feast of Tabernacles and all. But now just uh, a time down the road and, and we see that no longer were they honoring the Sabbath. The Sabbath became a day to make some extra money. Uh, and so now they suddenly started to, uh, to work seven days a week and, and to not honor that Sabbath day. And, uh, and so here we see that this was the breaking of the covenant that they had made with God. Now, what brought them into captivity? The breaking of the covenant with God. And so here Nehemiah is like, what? is going on. This is what got us taken out of the land in the first place. Now, remember, he had just gone back to Babylon. He had just seen Artaxerxes, and no doubt when he goes back to Babylon, what is he remembering? We were imprisoned here. We were taken captive here. We've been set free. I never want to go back there. I never want to have our nation end up in captivity. And he comes back, and what are the people doing? The very thing that God had sent them into captivity for in the first place. And so Nehemiah is like, hey, wake up, everybody. We need to learn the lesson that God has taught to us, uh, or else we are going to repeat the consequences. If, uh, if God gives Gave the consequences for breaking the covenant last time, uh, he will do it again. <laughs> and so we are not immune to the, the consequences of God. And so Nehemiah is greatly concerned. And so what does he do? He warns the people. So verse 16, and men of Tyre dwelt there also who brought in fish and all kinds of goods and sold them on the Sabbath to the children of Judah and in Jerusalem. So now merchants, the Gentile merchants were coming and they were setting up shop right there outside of Jerusalem and all the people from Jerusalem were coming out on the Sabbath and you know it's a day not a lot's going on so you know many of the of the Jewish shops weren't open so what did the Gentiles do they came and set up shop there hey less competition on the Sabbath but the people should not have come out to purchase if they didn't purchase the merchants from Tyre wouldn't have set up their their shop but the people are breaking the Sabbath. They're coming out and, and they're purchasing. And so uh, we see here that, that now even in Jerusalem, in the holy city where the temple was, 
and where the worship of God was kept, here we see that they were also breaking the Sabbath. Verse 17, Then I contended with the nobles of Judah and said to them, What evil thing is this that you do by which you profane the Sabbath day? Did not your fathers do thus? And did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? What has he just done? He's just rebuilt the walls. That, that's what their big giant effort was. And how had the walls been destroyed? They had been destroyed when they were taken into captivity. They just celebrated consecrating the walls now that they had to rebuild Why? because of the judgment upon them not keeping the covenant. And so he is like, you know, how short-sighted uh, are we on this? Did not your fathers do thus? Verse 18, and did not our God bring all this disaster on us and on this city? Yet you bring added wrath on Israel by profaning the Sabbath. And so here we see that that Jeremiah had also warned the people of the breaking of the Sabbath as well. In Jeremiah 17, it says, But if you will not uh, hearken unto me uh, and keep holy the Sabbath day, not to bear a burden, even entering in at the gates of Jerusalem on the Sabbath day, God says, Then I will kindle a fire in the gates thereof, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem, and it shall not be quenched. God had warned that if you are my covenanted people and you are breaking the covenant, then you are not going to prosper and judgment is going to come upon you. In verse 19, and so it was at the gates of Jerusalem as it began to be dark before the Sabbath that I commanded the gates to be shut and charged that they must not be opened till after the Sabbath. And then I posted some of my <laughs> servants at the gates so that no burdens would be brought in on the Sabbath day. And now the merchants and the sellers of all kinds of wares lodged outside Jerusalem once or twice. So they all come to set up their flea market, but the gates are locked. And no one's going in and no one's going out on the Sabbath here. And, uh, and so they, they lodged, they stayed out there outside of Jerusalem, it says, that they, they were hoping now that the Jews would come out and buy their goods, and uh, though they weren't admitted to be able to bring them into the city. In verse 21, though, Nehemiah isn't content to just let them wait there. Look at He says, then I warned them and said to them, why do you spend the night around the wall? If you do so again, I will lay hands on you. <laughs> He's telling them, I will thump you if you continue to, uh, to stay out there and entice uh, my people to sin. They were tempting the people to sin. And we see that Nehemiah does what he can to seal up and protect the people from the sin, but we also see that he goes and he removes the temptation as well. In our own houses, we need to seal up our houses against the, the world that is seeking to, to tempt us. And, and we need to remove those temptations that we are able to as well, so that we don't have to keep a, a constant battle. Is there a battle in your life, with the, in the world, trying to get in? God wants you to be victorious in, in that area. And here we see Nehemiah uh, leading the way on that. In verse 22, he says, And I commanded the Levites that they should cleanse themselves and that they should go and guard the gates to sanctify the Sabbath day. Remember me, O oh my God, concerning this also, and spare me according to the greatness of your mercy. Once again, he is seeing the sin of, the, of God's people, and he's saying, don't judge me for their sin. I'm doing what I can to, to keep them from this sin. He says in verse 23, In those days I also saw Jews who had married women of Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab, 
and half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod and could not speak the language of Judah, but spoke according to the language of one or the other people. Now, Ashdod was one of the five Philistine cities, and the Philistines are the perennial enemies uh, of the nation of Israel. But here we see that there was some intermarriage that had started to go on. You know, Nehemiah leaves, goes back to Artaxerxes, and when he comes back, he must have felt like, you know, uh, it's all broken loose, and, and everything is going in every single different direction. And, and, but we see that Nehemiah Nehemiah is a man of action. We see that he, he immediately deals with the problems head on. And I love that about Nehemiah, the way that, uh, that he is that man of action. And so, verse 25, so I contended with them, listen to this, and cursed them, struck some of them, and pulled out their hair, and made them swear by God, saying, you shall not give your daughters as wives to their sons, nor take their daughters for your sons or yourselves. So, here we see Nehemiah is, he's getting engaged in this, uh, you know, this fight with the, with the people. So, you know, it says that, that he he cursed to them. And what this means, he was assuring them that the curse of God would come upon them unless they repented. He was letting them know you cannot break God's law and think that you are not going to suffer consequences. I mean, that is just the bottom line. And I think it's so important for all of us to recognize that. That you can't have pet sins, that, that you cannot cultivate and sin in your life and then think that your life is going to be blessed. A little bit of leaven does what? Leaven's the entire lump. Your life is destined for destruction if you are playing with sin and trying to keep sin in your life and balance it with a holy life. If I, if I worship God, then can I just be, you know, just a little bit of law breaking? And then, you know, and we justify it and rationalize it. Nobody's perfect and, you know, I'm not perfect and so we don't contend with it. And we think that it's gonna be okay but ultimately it will bite us and it will drag us down and it will destroy us. And so it is dangerous. Sin is dangerous. It is like cancer. There is no safe cancer. When people have cancer, it is dealt with radically. It is dealt with quickly. They try and get every single cell of it out of the body. Absolutely, there's no playing around. If you have cancer in a small area, they take the whole area around it just in case that there's a stray cell that has gotten outside of the, uh, of the area. They, they, there is no fooling around when it comes to cancer. Sin is cancer of the soul. And you need to instantly, if it's in your life, you need to instantly deal with it, eradicate it, and get it out and purify your life. That is how dangerous it is, as dangerous to your soul as cancer is to your body. And so when, when Nehemiah sees that they're compromised, that they're playing, that, that they think, you know what, that's just a nice, you know, she's pretty, or he's so handsome, and he, he likes me, and he's like, I don't care, I'll pull his hair out, get, get out of here, you know, I mean, he'll destroy your soul, you know, what do you, what do you mean he looks nice, or, the, or she's pretty, and she's attractive? It's like you're headed for destruction. It's an instrument to draw you away from God into disobedience. And then you think that heading into disobedience is going to work out for you? It will never work out for you. It will never work out for you. It will always end so much worse than what God had planned for you. And so here we see Nehemiah, and, the, and he sees the people that are wandering away from God thinking that this is a good plan for their life. And so <coughs> Nehemiah lets him know, I think in some pretty strong terms, wouldn't you say he was expressing himself, you know, uh, in this aspect uh, here? But, you know, he makes them swear that you will not let your daughters or your sons marry the, the heathen. The Bible is just as clear in the New Covenant about believers not being married together with non-believers. God's people, and then there are those that are not God's people. And God's people should not be entangling themselves in the covenant that God created with other than who God established that covenant for. And, and so 
here again we see how Nehemiah deals with, with this issue. We see that, that this marrying and intermarrying with pagans, with non-believers, we see that even now Solomon, he's going to bring up the history of their own nation with Solomon. It says in verse 26, And did not Solomon, king of Israel, sin by these things? Yet among many nations there was no king like him, who was beloved of his God. And God made him king over all Israel. And nevertheless, pagan women caused even him to sin. Should we then hear of your doing all this great evil, transgressing against our God by marrying pagan women? And so here we see that even Solomon and all of his great wisdom did not recognize the spiritual danger of women, marital issues in his life by the women who did not know God and did not love God. And how he thought that that he could manage that and could maneuver around it. But instead, we see how far he slid away from God. It caused even him to sin and to head into uh, idolatry. And one of the sons of Joida, verse 28, the son of Eliashib, the high priest, was a son-in-law of Sanballat, the Horonite, and therefore I drove him from me. Now, remember Sanballat and also Tobiah. These were the, the enemies of Nehemiah. And Eliashib is the high priest. And what has he done? His son-in-law uh, of Sanballat. Uh, uh, and so we see now that he sinfully married a, a daughter of Sanballat. And, and so the priests and the high priests were not setting the right kind of example for the people. And the grandson of the high priest had now married Sanballat's daughter. And so, uh, verse 29, remember them, oh my God, because they have defiled the priesthood and the covenant of the priesthood and the Levites. And so here again you see with Nehemiah that Nehemiah isn't the one that is going to go and exact revenge or judgment. What does he do? He just turns it over to God. God, you see, you know what happened, you take care of it. And, and how that should be the same thing in our life. We want to forgive everybody. And we want God to deal with the judgment and the chastisement of, uh, of anybody that it has hurt us or is doing wrong. And we want to continue to move forwards in right relationship with God. In verse 30, Thus I cleanse them of everything pagan, and I also assign duties to the priests and the Levites, each to his service, and to bringing the wood offering and the first fruits at appointed times. Remember me, oh my God, for good. And so this is the third time here we see uh, Nehemiah asking to remember the things that he has done to push forwards the kingdom of God amongst God's people. May May we also be pushing forwards the kingdom of God uh, in our life. May we be willing to confront the things, the areas of compromise that, uh, that might be in our lives. And, and may we put into place corrections to be able to be God-honoring in our life. We want the fullness of God's blessing in our life. Amen? I want the fullness of God's blessing in my life. I don't want to leave half of the blessings that God had for me uh, there on the table. I want to receive the fullness of what God has, the blessings that he has for me. And so we do that by how? Aligning ourselves to his will, keeping him first in our life, loving God and loving others and trusting now in his provision in our life. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word. Thank you for the example of Nehemiah and the reforms of Nehemiah. And Lord, we pray now that you would help us in our own lives. If, if there are any walls around Jerusalem in our life that need to be shored up, that need to be rebuilt, that need to be consecrated, if, Lord, the worship of you needs to increase in our heart and in our lives, Lord, then and then we pray for that tonight, Lord. We ask that you would just uh, help us grow in those areas, Lord, that we need growth in. We ask you to heal us, bless us, help us, 
strengthen us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray.